Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. I have the pleasure tonight to introduce you to really quite an interesting uh, young lady. Um, her name is uh, Mara Estrada, um, who uh, is a executive producer and host of Cultured, a weekly pop culture radio show with a lens on diversity. She's also a beauty and culture expert who appears on numerous radio and television outlets across Canada, including The Social, Entertainment, Tonight, Canada, and Global News. She's the founder and former editor-in-chief of Fuja Media, a digital publication geared to the modern Canadian South Asian woman. As a freelance writer, Mira has bylines in El Canada, Refinery29, Flair, Chatelaine, Bustle, HuffPost, and more. But most interestingly to me, she is one of the contributing authors of a book entitled Untold, The Defining Moments of the Uprooted, uh, which uh, has just been released. Uh, the book explores the defining moments, moments of uprooted people in a collection of real life stories that explore the South Asian experience in the US, UK, and Canada. Her story focuses on her experience being born in an untouchable, or a, what's the word, a Dalit? Mm -hmm. A Dalit. A, yeah. a Dalit, and how her personal experiences with uh, the case system uh, in Canada have played a role in shaping her identity. Armed with a degree from the Shuluk School of Business, paired with a postgraduate degree in multi multimedia journalism, Mara is a force of media savvy. Fantastic. Wow, thank you. <laughs> so thank welcome to our show. And, and, you know, how did you come to write this book? Yeah, well, um, so I wanted to, it, I mean, I'm 42 years old now. And it wasn't until I was 40 years old. So just two years ago, it took me 40 years to openly start speaking about the caste system and my place in the caste system and the, how that's really played a large part in defining my identity. So um, when I heard about this book and, you know, the diaspora talking about stories about our identity, I really wanted to tell my story um, because once I came forward and opened up about it, sort of like the floodgates opened and I knew that once I came forward, I, I needed as many people to hear about the caste system and these especially silenced voices like my, myself um, within the caste system. And so this was sort of just one of the starting points of having that conversation started. Well, and it, it sounds like a fascinating uh, book and story, and I want to get into that in a minute. But first of all, um, it seems like you've had an illustrious career already. And besides that, so, so tell us a little bit about you know, Schulich School of Business and, uh, and, a, and a postgraduate in multimedia journalism and uh, um, arts and uh, culture radio show. How have you done all that? Yeah, I mean, well, for me, it's sort of, uh, I sort of fell into Schulich. I have always wanted to be a journalist from, as a young child. And I think even cast played into that. Uh, my parents always had said, you know, at that time, um, in the late 90s, there wasn't a lot of faces like mine, brown faces on television, um, you know, reading the news and, you know, anchors and reporters. And so my parents had said, you know what, uh, you're so smart, do something um, that's safe with your career, because the way that they escaped that poverty was through education. And so for me, I really took it to heart. And so I did a business degree instead of following my passion and pursuit which really was journalism and it wasn't until later on I still had that that fire in my belly that I really wanted to do journalism so uh, I did the safe business degree which I don't regret at all now I mean I have all those skills now and then I later went on to pursue my degree in journalism um, which I'm so glad because I'm I really am so passionate about telling these stories and especially telling these stories of voices that are often um, it's like the book untold stories. Were you born in Canada or were you born in India? I was actually born in England um, and then I came to Canada as a child. And, uh, and yet the caste system still followed you here? It did. I mean, the cat, and this is the thing about the caste system. People often will say, oh, you know, that's something that's so outdated and it's something that, you know, only happens in rural India. I never even lived in India, um, but the caste system has followed me here from England to Canada and has stayed with me throughout my entire life. And it has played such defining roles in my life. And you will find it, it is here in the diaspora. And um, 
it affects every aspect in terms of our jobs, in terms of marriage. I really felt it the hardest for me um, when I was in those years of, you know, in my 20s, when people are talking, especially you'll see in, in South Asian communities, we still talk about not so much arranged marriage, but, you know, like matchmaking, that type of thing. And you would hear, because we weren't talking about caste openly at that time, um, I hadn't talked about it openly. It would be in like aunties and things like that at the temple or community events be like, oh, there's a great boy for you. And he's from a quote, unquote, good family. He's a good boy. He's from, they would say upper caste families, sort of assuming that I was because I'm a very well-educated, uh, well-spoken girl. And then I would think, but what am I? And what happens when I have to say who I am? Am I not a quote unquote good girl? Do I not have a good family? Am I not a good fit? And it would come up time and time again, not so much in the negative ways that were spoken about lower caste people and just how we were erased completely. And so what would happen? Did you, uh, are you married? Did you marry someone of your own caste? What happened? I actually ended up gravitating towards um, dating people outside my culture altogether. And I think at that time, I didn't even realize I was doing that consciously, but I think I ended up marrying somebody that's actually not Indian at all. He's half West Indian and half Spanish. Um, but I think I started to date men outside of my culture because I had that sort of gut f fear of what happens when I, I finally have to come out and say, say my cast and I'm never going to be good enough. I'm never going to be the good girl, the right fit. And um, I think it really tore me down that when I finally settled down with my husband, I just felt this relief of, I can just be me and just be myself and myself is good enough, which is a, a horrible, horrible thing. Well, horrible that it had to happen only once you left your culture, but wonderful that you actually got to feel that way, that you could be who you are. Um, ultimately, we're going to take a break uh, for some messages and come back with uh, Mera Estrada in just a minute. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Brian Crombie Radio. Hour. We're chatting about diversity and uh, and the caste system and that the caste system um, with uh, with uh, the uh, our, our guest's example really has followed her and not followed her from India, but followed from India to her in the UK and then into Canada because she was never actually even born in India. She was born in the UK. Um, we're chatting with uh, Mera Estrada, who is a... Uh, uh, a pop culture radio show um, host of Culture D. She's a beauty and culture expert. She's been on numerous different shows and she's written, um, she's been a contributing author to a book called Untold, The Defining Moment Moments of the Uprooted. Um, so maybe Mera, let's take a big step back if we could and explain to our listeners, what is the caste system? Yeah, so the caste system, I mean, it's over 2000 years old. It um, originated if we're talking about the Indian caste system from the Vedic scripts in Indian scriptures. Um, but at that time, it's really been twisted and turned. So originally the caste, um, there was four different categories and it was based on, you know, there was the Brahmins who were the, the scholars and the preachers. Then there was the, the Kshatriyas who were the warriors. There was the, um, um, sorry, the Vaishvas who are the farmers and the merchants. And then there was the Shridras who was the, the workmen and the service providers. And at that time in the scriptures and the Vedic scriptures, there was never any hierarchy. What ended up happening is during British colonial time, during the British Raj, um, there was this British census in 1901, Herbert Hope Risley actually ended up categorizing people. It was sort of a way to classify people all people were put into these categories, these four different categories. And it ended up being part of law as well. And so that was governing law and that then sort of it became a hierarchy and only upper caste people were allowed in certain uh, positions and jobs. Uh, a law even was passed later on that um, certain caste, I think it was, it was between 1860 and 1920 that this whole system of caste became very ingrained into government. 
a criminal tribes act passed in 1871 that said certain people by their birthright were criminals. And that's where this whole notion- Sorry, by their birthright were criminals. Yes, were criminals. And so that's where this whole notion of untouchables, they came into that where they were just almost seen as doing such that untouchables were the people that were seen as doing menial jobs such as um, cleaning bathrooms and latrines or like my family's, like my grandfather, my grandfather before him who were tanners and working with um, animal carcasses and things that need to be done or um, dead body removal, things like that. These are things that need to be done, but seeing them as so unpure and by doing nature of those jobs, also making them um, in pure of the soul. So the the whole hierarchy of this happened during the British Raj, and it sort of never went away. And well, it's like it's, the, the Brits brought their class systems from uh, from the exactly. UK to India. Yeah. So whereas what started in Vedic uh, in Vedic scriptures sort of become like so many things became twisted and turned and turned, and now it's just it stayed here and it's become this ugly, ugly thing. And people will say, no, it's gone away and we've become more modernized, but that it's so deep rooted, much like we see um, if you look in America, like when things are so deep rooted and deep green, and if we don't take care of them and speak about them and recognize them, it can't go away because we haven't recognized it yet. How did it impact your family and your family's life in India? I mean, gravely, I mean, I lost my grandfather, my father's father, at such a young age, he died of asthma, while my father was in his early 20s. Um, You know, he left behind a widow and four children, just because they were so, so poor. And he was an uneducated man. At that time, untouchables were not even allowed in school buildings. So he was not educated, because if he wanted to learn, he would have to sit outside of a classroom and try to listen in to hear what was happening. Um, so Untouchables was, weren't allowed to actually get schooling? No. Um, in my father's era. And so, you know, my grandfather had asthma, tried to work, obviously no access to even the basic, an inhaler, things like that. Even at that time, you should be able to have basic to those things. But when you're that poor, you don't. And unfortunately, my grandfather died while my father was still very young. My father, in his era, it was the era of segregation. So he was allowed to go to school. He had to sit at the back of the classroom. He was not called by his name. He was called backward class. So they called backward class. My father had to stand up. If an upper class person came, my father had to put his head in the ground because his shadow was even seen as impure. He was not allowed to drink from the same water as higher caskets. He was not allowed to go inside of temples or buildings or public buildings or public gatherings or public walkways. Like, we're talking about a serious segregation and daily degradation. That is what my own father experienced. And the fact that my father still got himself educated, got himself out of the village. I've been to my father's village uh, several times to India. It is, I can't, it brings me to tears to think about it. It is so, it is made out of cow dung. It is like, there's chickens while you can see the front door to the back door. It's not even, you know, it's like made out of clay and cloud cow dung. And I see what my father came from to what he is now. And it's phenomenal that we got out of India because so, so few people do because you're sort of trapped into that cycle of poverty. It's very, very difficult to become educated. How how did he get out of India? He, um, Fortunately, he married on my mother, on my mother's side, my grandfather, that grandfather was very, very committed to education. I think he knew in his head, the only way was education. So that my grandfather, my mother's side actually learned to read and write sitting outside of a classroom. And he instilled that into my mother that education is our way out. So he actually moved his family to East Africa. And um he went from doing tanning to actually having a leather shoe shop. And then he, from there, that side of the family moved to England. So my father was lucky enough to marry my mother and my mom actually ended up helping my father further his education, um, do university. And that's why it was so ingrained in my brother and I, we have to have to 
succeed in school because of our birthright. And that is our only way to get out of this cycle. When did you find out, uh, or did you find out what your caste was? I did was? when I was 15. And my parents like sat me down very, you know, it was stoic. I remember being in my living room and they sat us down. They're like, we have to tell you something. Um, and they said, you know, you're an untouchable. And I was like, untouchable, what is that? You know, I'd only heard about it in like, you know, like the mafia movies. I'm like, I don't even know what that is. I'm like, no, a princess, because I had heard about, there is a king, um, my maiden name is Solanke and there's a King Solanke. And I'm like, no, 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 I'm a princess. And that is all true too. But there was also a fall from grace where we had become untouchables. And, and they had a very just serious conversation with us, not giving all the details at the time on the emphasis of education for us, because they said, as rosy as things look now, people are going to look at you differently. And I started to notice then how people did look at us differently, not even knowing the cast because my parents didn't speak about it openly at that time. Just hearing the conversations of how people would always talk about caste, more how they would talk about upper caste and how it was very much elevated and praised. So I would always think, but what about the flip side of that? Now this is in, uh, in what, London, England? This was here in Canada because I moved quite young. I moved when I was five years old um, to Canada. Uh, so in Toronto and, and within the, uh, the Indian uh, diaspora, uh, in Canada, you found that attention to caste. Oh, yes, all the time. Up until now, up until very, very recently, in conversations which made it very uncomfortable with my own circle of friends, which is very difficult as a teen and as a young adult, you know, as you're finding your way and feeling, you know, you're not quite sure where you belong. You don't quite belong in that community. And then there's also the larger racism that you're experiencing as well. So would it, your, would your friends know or want to find out or talk about and ask you what cast you're in? Yeah. Sometimes they, um, they would sort of just mention it in more talking about theirs and just assuming that I was sort of of the same upper crust as them, because most people that have immigrated are of an, a higher, a higher caste because you, you often need money to to come out of India and you know to or to afford that education to to immigrate, right? So it was, was sort of more um, spoken about it in the way how I mean that we weren't spoken about. But I always knew these are the people that you're looking down on are is me. The people that you're looking down on is you. That must have felt very personal, very personally insulting. It did. It, and um, as a young person, especially as a very young, you know, when you're going through those years, I mean, I'm, I'm in my 40s now and I'm much more grounded. But when you're in those early years of your teens and early 20s, it's, it becomes a very confusing time. You seem to be very involved in uh, your, uh, your, your culture. Um, do you think it impacts you at all today? I think it does. And I think that is what has really pushed me to be such a social justice activist in everything I do. Um, I'm, I think even with my radio show, I always am pushing to have those voices that don't have those huge platforms told because I think those voices are so worthy. And I know that from my own experience. And even in stories like this, I feel like I am just one story. There's so many stories. And I hope those stories get told because they're of so much value. We're chatting tonight with uh, Mera Estrada. Um, she is a, a journalist. Uh, she's a pop culture radio show host. Um, she is a specialist on diversity. Uh, she's been on numerous different uh, television shows, and she's the founder and former editor-in-chief of uh, Fusion Media. We're talking about how the caste system has impacted her and her uh, life. We're going to take a break and come back um, for some more in just a minute. Stay with us. 
Welcome back to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour. We're talking about the caste system um, that uh, I thought really was something that uh, was of a bygone uh, era in India. And what uh, Mera Estrada is talking about is that really is uh, is still uh, having some impact on, on her and other people's lives in Canada today. Uh, she never actually uh, was born in India. She was born in the United uh, Kingdom um, and then moved to uh, Canada as a young lady. Um, but um, but the caste system and its impact has uh, has followed her. Uh, so Mera, um, tell me, how do you think it's impacted you in in Canada, you talked about marriage, um, or uh, you know, marriageable uh, people, and that the aunties may not want to have uh, introduced you to certain people. Um, other than that, has it impacted you? Um, yeah, I mean, I think in terms of self-esteem, for sure. Like I said, after I had found out, uh, I went through a lot of self-esteem issues. But even not just me personally. Um, you know, there has been finally people speaking up about uh, caste discrimination and violence um, in North America and Canada and the United States. In just this past year, a lawsuit was initiated against Cisco and two of its employees because of discrimination, specifically caste-based discrimination of a lower caste um, Indian engineer and that is because as we see more and more um, people from India coming to, to North America, they're bringing that, those same caste-based, I don't know what to call it, values with them. And that belief system is coming with them. And so a study was done as well. And in that study, it said 67% of Dalits feel that they are being treated unfairly in the workplace because of their caste. And that is workplaces that have a larger uh, South Asian population. And we look at, um, for example, in Silicon Valley, things like that, where there is a large percent of South Asians. So that is following them. That caste-based um, discrimination is following them. The same types of studies have been done in the UK as well now. And so I feel like in the United States and the UK, they're starting to look at that. I hope in Canada, we start to look at that as well because we have large South Asian populations here as well. And like I said, I know I'm not alone in what I've been through and there's people that are going through this and I, I hope that they find some strength to speak up about it because it's not right. And people don't wanna have the conversations because they are uncomfortable conversations. But just like we're having these conversations around race and white privilege and people might feel uncomfortable about that until we can have those conversations around caste privilege and it might be an uncomfortable conversation until we have those open and honest conversations, we're not going to get anywhere. Is, is, is our caste systems racism? They're not racism, they're very different, aren't they? They are different. I'm saying it in the same sort of parallels as until we can acknowledge it, that it's happening and acknowledge that there is privilege, we can't, we can't move forward. But it seems so strange, like racism, not that I can understand it, but, but racism, sometimes you can see, but, but the caste prejudice is something you can't even see. It's something that's from your great, 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 great grandfather or grandmother. Exactly, which I mean, and it's in a way it is also like race, right? It's something that who I was born as says nothing about me. Like what occupation my great, 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 great grandfather did has absolutely nothing to me. Just like the color of my skin says nothing about my, my character. Why did you wait so long to speak about it openly? You said you didn't really talk about it until you were 40 and you're only 42 now. <laughs> whenever somebody asks me this I, I feel quite emotional because quite honestly it's twofold number one there was a sense of, of real fear because in those early years I was very fearful of of hurting my family because if I come it's almost like a coming out if I come out, I'm not just coming out for myself. I'm, 
I am coming out for my entire family. And knowing what my father especially has gone through and my grandfather and for them to not say anything I know there was reasons for that and knowing the violence that they have experienced I was fearful what will people how will people treat us or how will people treat my parents I was very fearful for them what was and that should tell you how real it is no, it does. There's no question. What was the story that you told in this uh, anthology book, um, uh, Untold? Um, so I did. I told. I spoke a little bit about um, my family's history, and sort of that there was a key point. And when I say like this is so prevalent right now, there was something that happened with a close friend of mine, which was my breaking point where I had to say to my parents. I have to openly tell this story because this is happening in my generation and my circle of friends. And this is how they are going to be raising their children. And I need to speak about this. And it was a very defining moment and a very horrible moment, but it pushed me. It was sort of the straw that broke the camel's back that I said, I need to start speaking about this openly. Can you tell us what happened? Can you read the book? Give us a little synopsis. It was, um, it's sort of a moment of uh, betrayal. Imagine you have a very close friend and you just realize that you don't know them at all. That this very good close friend ended up uh, doing something because of your cast that, uh, that you weren't expecting and you were surprised by. Yes. Gravely disappointed by it. And uh, do you speak to the person now? Um, very, uh, very limited. Have they read the book? Do they know the story? Do they know the impact that it had on you? Uh, I don't know if they do. I don't know if they have read the book or read the story yet. I hope to have a conversation one day. I don't know if I'm ready yet, but. Um, you know, caste, racism, uh, prejudice has been sort of uh, really one of the big topics in the past year um, in the mainstream media. Um, how do you feel about that? Um, I feel, I mean, glad is a strange word. I'm glad that I feel like it's so long overdue. This is nothing new when we talk about a pandemic. It's a dual pandemic. The pandemic of racism is not a new one. And I'm I'm grateful we are finally having like these long, long needed conversations on race at the same time as a South Asian woman. I see so much hypocrisy, especially when I see people in the South Asian community that stand behind issues of racism, you know, sort of performative activism, you know, posting a black square or even, you know, the pride in, uh, you know, Kamala Harris. And at the same time, I see the amount of casteism and classism amongst our South Asian group. And I just, I just wish they could see you, you can't fight for one and not fight for the other. Like you have to be a social justice act advocate. I don't know how you can have such hypocrisy. And for my own, I say, I can say this because it's my own community. I wish my own community would recognize that about themselves. Robert Putman, one of the foremost American uh, sociologists uh, who wrote the book Bowling Alone in America that really talked about social capital in, in, uh, in, in the world um, back uh, you know, a generation ago, has recently written a book um, about education being the new um, racial divide almost uh, within, uh, in, within Western society where the rich only marry the rich and the poor only marry the poor and that it's uh, becoming far more difficult to go from poor to rich in today's society uh, because of uh, barriers for education and, uh, and that particularly people are only friends with, only associate with and only marry people of their own uh, income level. Um, are we recreating a caste system? Yeah, in some ways, I mean, if you look at, um, there is the book by Isabel Wilkerson called Cast, and she very much 
in that she is comparing um, <clears throat> Black America to some forms of a caste system. She compares it to even the Indian casteism and Nazi Germany as well. It's, it's a fantastic book. It's also becoming, it's being adapted into a screenplay by Ava DuVernay. But I think in a lot of ways, it's not just India that suffers from caste. It's so many, we can call it classism as well, just like you said. Um, it's, a much, it's a larger problem that we have. And like you said, the gap is getting wider and wider. We're not getting closer and closer. The gap is widening. Well, I was born in Montreal, and some people thought that the Anglos on Westmount uh, treated uh, the Francophones. Uh, in fact, someone wrote a book about uh, the Francophones being uh, Canada's Negroes, um, and it was a, a very negative uh, book. Um, and uh, and then I lived in Boston, and people referred to some of the people in Back Bay as the Boston uh, Brahmins. Um, and then, you know, I think in Toronto, there's people that... Uh, will only marry people if they've gone to the right uh, private schools. So don't we have these castes, classes, mm -hmm. stratifications in society almost everywhere? We do. And it's, it's a large, large issue. Um, but all I can speak is to the one I know, which has been, it's, it's not just the, it's not just it is actual, it's, it's made itself from that time of the British Raj, it's made itself actually into concrete classifications. And I know that needs to be, that needs to be broken down and done away with. But you're obviously proud of your culture. You, uh, you, um, you know, are a fashion uh, beauty consultant and expert uh, in the area. You're a, you're, you're, uh, you've got a South Asian, um, um, media show, et cetera. Does this call into question your culture? So, so no, so this is the thing. I'm very proud of my culture. Uh, I love my culture. Even I'm, I grew up very religious. I grew up going to um, in Sunday school at the temple every Sunday. I think people do twist and turn things. That's why I, I have nothing against the Hindu scriptures even. There are bad things. Like you can't love your culture without seeing the good and bad. And that is in every culture. There is good and bad. And I don't want to throw away my culture. I want to fix the wrong about it. And I can accept that there are a lot of wrong things. I come from a very patriarchal culture. That is not just my culture. That is a lot of cultures. Um, you know, there are problems with abuse. There's problem, there are a lot of different problems within my culture. There are a lot of amazing things about my culture. I want to work on fixing the bad sides whilst I can still embrace the good. There's been a bunch of um, media attention, uh, Indian matchmaking from Netflix, uh, the film White Tiger. Um, you know, I think some shows about... Uh, um, crazy Rich Asians, you know, a whole bunch of different uh, movies that have uh, maybe brought attention to some of these issues. Is that helpful or harmful? I think it's twofold. So I think it is helpful that it find, it brings it to the mainstream and there is more appetite for um, people are curious, people that don't necessarily know what is the caste system. Even in, I think, India's in Netflix matchmaking, Indian matchmaking, we heard the word cast so many times. If you watch The White Tiger, I had a great interview actually with the director of the film, you will hear the word cast over and over again. It's the predominant theme. That brings it to the forefront so people can have these conversations. On the flip side, I always go back to who is the storyteller? Whose gaze is this coming from? And that's where I hope more people like myself who have come from not that dominating ruling class or caste, the people who have been subjugated to the discrimination and segregation and who have been voiceless. I hope this provides a space for us to tell our stories and for us to also be gatekeepers of those stories as well. And so I think it's great that these stories are coming out and it will allow more space for people who have experienced it on the flip side, not just people who want to tell a savior story to come forward. 
Tell me a little bit about the other stories that are in this book. Um, the book is honestly phenomenal. Um, it looks at so many different stories uh, from, uh, you know, adoption, um, divorce, um, loss, LGBT, T, LGBTQ stories, um, just so many stories in the diaspora and often stories that are might be seen as taboo or like mine, just not spoken about. And I think it's not that they never existed. It's that there might've been fear or shame or that they were just silenced. And so that I think untold is almost like the perfect name for it. Are you going to turn it into a movie or anything? That has always, always been my hope. When from when I first told my parents, I want to talk about this. They said, I would really love the world to, to see our family story in a movie. I feel like art is so powerful and such a powerful medium, especially in evoking emotion. I would really, really love um, to one day make this um, story into a movie. That is my hope for this. At a uh, film festival, um, a South Asian film festival, I think two years ago, I saw a film of uh, The Challenge, a uh, gay um, Pakistani uh, Muslim gentleman had in uh, being raised by a, a father who uh, was uncomfortable, extremely uncomfortable and oppositional to his uh, his homosexuality and the challenges uh, that uh, that they had as a as a family, and that he was uh, sexually uh, abused uh, during his uh, childhood. It was an incredibly powerful film. Uh, I saw it with a, uh, um, uh, a person that I was with uh, was a uh, a Muslim female um, who afterwards broke down crying and said uh, to me, told to me a story of how she was abused when she was a child. And she said, I was only the second person in her life she'd ever told, but that that art, that film mm -hmm. that was so compelling brought out to her the uh, memories um, of what happened, which was the bad, but also the good of that she wanted to tell someone about it and uh, wanted to found it very therapeutic. So I think you're right. Art can be an incredible voice for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think sometimes it's, a, it's safe as well for people um, to see themselves in art. Uh, it provides a bit of space and some safety. And so it's a, it feels like a safe medium as well for a lot of people. I had a uh, child psychologist uh, speak to, uh, to a Mississauga Arts Council uh, task force meeting that we had uh, a little while back. And she said uh, about art, she said, when our voice fails us, art speaks for us. Mm -hmm. I thought that was really, really, really profound. Anyway, yeah. we're taking uh, uh, an interesting conversation uh, tonight with Mara Estrada about diversity, about the caste system uh, that isn't just in India, but that's in Canada and that uh, she has uh, uh, experienced the negative effects of it uh, in her own personal life. We're going to take a final break and come back with some concluding comments in just a minute. Stay with us. Well, welcome back to the Brian Crumby Radio, our Saga 960. We're chatting with Merara Estrada, who is uh, an executive producer and host of Culture D, a weekly pop culture radio show with a lens on diversity. Mara, where can we see that? You can find Cultured on Global News Radio, 640. It is on every Saturday night at 8 p.m. And you can also catch the podcast anywhere you get podcasts, Apple, Google Podcasts. Um, yes. She's also the founder and former editor-in-chief of Fusion Media, a digital publication geared to the modern Canadian South Asian woman. Uh, is that still in print? Uh, we no longer print, but we do still have the digital version. So that is at fusia.ca. At fusia.ca. Okay, great. And uh, you're the contributing author of a book entitled Untold, Defining Moments of the Uprooted. Um, where can we get that? So the book is available for pre-order right now, and you can pick that up either at Mango and MarigoldPress.com or Brown Girl Magazine. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have the link right now with me, but uh, Brown Girl Magazine or Mango and Marigold Press. Why did you want to have this interview? What do you hope people take away from it? I wanted to do, really do this because I know that my story is not unique as unique as it may be 
in certain aspects. It is just one of many, many stories about casteism here in North America. And I wanna change that. And I know a lot of people have questions about caste. I wanted to provide listeners with information about what that is, help them understand what it is and how it's how casteism is spreading across the diasporas. And I want people to really stop turning that blind eye that this is not that their problem and that this is not something that exists because I am here sitting in front of you as living proof that it does. And I know it's an uncomfortable conversation and it might not be a convenient conversation, but it is one that we need to have if we ever want this to go away. Some of those aunties that uh, wouldn't introduce you to the right guy back uh, a couple of years ago, and they are listening to this interview. What do you think their reactions going to be to it? I don't know if their attitudes would ever change. In hindsight, I would say thank you because I found the perfectly right guy. Um, but it, I feel terrible for their children and the people around them because they are raising people with value systems of negativity and hate. And if they can't be saved, I sure hope that their younger generations can be. You know, this uh, past year has been one where racial uh, injustice, uh, racial inequality, uh, whether it be in the Black Lives Matter movement or frankly, it's uh, and when we see how uh, the COVID-19 uh, epidemic has uh, hit certain cultures and certain races, uh, certain income levels far uh, more uh, um, profoundly than, than, other, uh, than other people's. Uh, it's really been an issue, and uh, and I think that uh, what you've done is uh, elevated that it's uh, an issue not just of race, um, and unquestionably in the past we've been uh, made aware of issues on sexual orientation, but for you it's of class, um, whether it's the caste system in India or the classes systems uh, from uh, from our own cultures, uh, or whether it's just people's prejudice against people that don't have the right jobs or the right education or the right uh, the right family background. Uh, people have got to be accepted for who they are and that we're all equal. That's right. Well, thank you so much for telling us your story. And if we want to follow you, um, how, how best do we follow you? Is there a social media account that you want to let us all know about? Yeah, you can follow me uh, most easily at Instagram at Mira.Estrada or on Twitter at Mira Estrada. Mira Strata, thank you so much for joining us on the Brian Crombie Radio Hour. I come to you every Monday through Friday, 6 o'clock on 9.60 a.m., or you can stream me online at www.saga960am.ca, or you can get all my podcasts and videocasts after the fact on my website, briancrombie.com. Thank you for joining us. Good night.